Well, very good evening, everyone, brothers and sisters and young people and friends. Uh, welcome to our Bible address this evening. We're going to start, as we normally do, with a hymn, hymn 124. The Lord is King, lift up thy voice, O earth, and all ye heavens rejoice. From world to world, the joy shall ring, the Lord omnipotent is King, hymn 124. continue in a word of prayer. Almighty Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we approach unto thy throne of grace once more through the mediation of our Saviour and our Redeemer, thy Son, the Lord Jesus. And Lord, we offer our praises to thy name. We extol thee as the maker of all things. And we are thankful indeed for thy word, for that message of salvation to man. We're thankful, Lord, that we have been minded to respond to those things written so many years ago. But those things which are so relevant to today and especially for the near future. And so we pray, Lord, for our Lord Jesus Christ, to return as King, to establish thy kingdom. And we pray, Lord, that while the opportunity is still with us, that those who are minded respond to the invitation to immortality and to the glories of the kingdom age. Lord, we uh, marvel at the wonder of thy plan and purpose and of thy great power in this earth. For we see those things around us which proclaim that it is thou, Lord, that rules in the kingdoms of men. And so, Lord, as we meet together this evening and as we open thy word, may it be that our wisdom and understanding is increased of those things which are concerning eternity. 
on the glory of thine image. And so, Lord, bless us as we seek to come unto thy throne of grace. Bless us in prayer. Through Jesus we ask. Amen. Well, we're pleased uh, today, this evening, to have the service of our brother, brother Jonathan Janaway from the Fawley Ecclesia. The subject this evening is, what is the kingdom of God? And to introduce Brother Jonathan's remarks, which we'll hear in a moment, we're going to first take a, a reading, an introductory reading from Ezekiel chapter 37. So Ezekiel being one of the prophets foretelling the future for the, the kingdom of Israel and for those who are called to be a part of spiritual Israel also. We're going to read Ezekiel 37 beginning at verse 21. And say, other, say unto them, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king to them all, and they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned and will cleanse them. So shall they be my people and I will be their God. And David, my servant, shall be king over them. And they, sh they all shall have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob, my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell therein, they and their children and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an ever everlasting covenant with them and I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God and they shall be my people. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord. Sorry, that I the Lord do sanctify Israel and my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. So we turn to Brother Jonathan now to offer his address. What is the kingdom of God? Thank you. Uh, try and share our screen. Hopefully we can see that. Is that okay, John? Yeah. Thank you. Well, thanks. We would normally say thanks for coming out on this dark evening, but obviously we're not doing that at the moment. So... Thanks, everybody, for logging on to hear this uh, Bible talk. Tonight, we're going to answer that question from the book, which hopefully we all have in front of us. As Christadelphians, we believe the Bible to be the inspired word of God. If you listen to any Christadelphian talks on a regular basis, you should always find that we use our Bibles to prove all our points. So we'll be turning up passages in the Bible. And while we have put the key parts of the quotes on the screen, if you have trouble finding them. I find I remember and understand things better if I actually turn the scriptures up uh, myself. So I would encourage you, if you can, to look at the passages in your own Bibles. So uh, we have some overheads and I have my glamorous assistant set to, uh, sat to my left doing the overheads because I say being a man, I can't do more than one thing at once. And it has been known for me to do a talk and then realise I haven't changed any of the slides. So, firstly, before we can understand what the kingdom of God is, we need to know 
what is a kingdom? Well, the dictionary definition gives us a country, a state or a territory ruled by a king or queen. What does a kingdom consist of? Well, you can identify eight parts. A king, rulers, people, land, a capital, language, religion and laws. If we think about the country we live in, which is conveniently named the United Kingdom, we have a king, well, a queen, Queen Elizabeth, rulers, uh, that would be the MPs and like, people, that's us, a land, Great Britain, capital of London, language, English, religion, well, nominally uh, the Church of England or Christian, and the laws are the laws we live under, passed by our parliament. Over the past few months and years, we've seen a number of events take place, uh, such as wars in Syria, terrorist attacks in London, Manchester, several in Paris, um, just, just recently, and virtually all around the world. And, no, and we, know, uh, we know that we're living at the moment in a pandemic, which has also affected the whole world, with all, the, all these events have shaken the world we live in to its core. I'm sure you've heard friends or colleagues or neighbours say, I don't know what the world's coming to, and being genuinely frightened for their and their family's well-being. The Bible tells us that the current situation in the world cannot continue. Come with me first, if you would, to the words of the Lord Jesus in Luke chapter 21. Jesus' disciples here were admiring the, uh, the temple built by Herod. And this is what Jesus says. If we go to Luke 21, and we'll go in at verse 5. Luke chapter 21 and verse 5. And as some spake of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts, he, Jesus, said, as for these things which ye behold, the day will come in the which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And they asked him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be? And what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? And he said, Take heed that ye be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near. Go ye not, therefore, after them. But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. I think you'll agree some of these things sound pretty familiar. Verse 10 goes on. Then said he unto them, Nations shall rise up against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Look at what we've been seeing on our news regularly just recently. Syria, Egypt, Turkey, Russia, all on the news every day in the past month. Verse 11 says, great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, famines, pestilences, fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. We've, we've, even, uh, we've seen, even in the UK, massive floods bringing parts of the north of the country to a standstill. They seem to happen more and more regularly. Even man's flood defences are unable to stand the power of the rain sent from God. Some of the words in this chapter initially apply to the destruction of, of Jerusalem in AD 70 by the Romans, which isn't our subject for today. But the message has a prophetic meaning as well. Verse 20, we read, and when ye see Jerusalem compassed about with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains and let them which are in the midst depart out and let not them which are in the countries enter here too. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. Verse 24 goes on, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Well, we know Jerusalem was recaptured by the Jews in 1967. So we know that this is now talking about our time. And verse 25, there shall be signs in the sun, 
in the moon and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. In the Bible, the sun and the moon and the stars are ways of saying the rulers and the leaders. Think back to Genesis 37 and Joseph's dream. Verse 26 goes on, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking upon those things which are coming on the earth, for the power of the heavens shall be shaken. I would say that's about where we are at right at this present time. Verse 27 goes on. Then shall they see the son of man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to come to pass, then look up, lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. As Bible students, we're privileged to know that there is a hope for this world and that the situation of war, famine and terror will not continue. We're told that when we see these things, lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth near. God is in control, and Jesus Christ is coming back to the earth. Turn with me to Acts, if you would, please. Acts and chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, and we'll go in at verse 6. When they therefore were come together... They asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times and the seasons which the father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto, both, uh, unto me, both in Israel, in all Judea and in Samaria and in the uttermost parts of the earth. When he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner, as ye have seen him go into heaven. So Act gives us our first key fact about God's kingdom. Verse 6, it will, be, uh, it will be the restored kingdom of Israel. Verse 11 tells us it will be on the earth. Note, not, of, it, not heaven, as some religious religions around us teach. Um, come with me, if you would, to Isaiah and chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2, and we'll read the first four verses. The word that Isaiah, the saint son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord, or Yahweh's house, shall be established in the top of the mountains, shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye. Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among nations, shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. To put that into context or perspective, global military spending last year, according to Google, is said to be some 1.2 trillion US dollars. So that's a one with 10 zeros behind it, or if you prefer, a million million. So a time of peace is what we long for. No more famine, no more pestilence, no more war. So we have more information in this Isaiah about this kingdom. There will be a house of God, we're told in verse 2. All nations shall flow to it. Verse 3 tells us the laws will be God's laws. And verse 4, there will be peace. To understand more about the kingdom of God, what it will be like, let's apply the same logic we did in the beginning to the United Kingdom, to the kingdom of God. So firstly, we come to a king. Well, if we turn to John 18, we, we will find this is part of a discourse with Pilate during Jesus' trial. 
for brevity, I'd like to just jump in at verse 36. So that's John 18, and we'll go in at verse 36. Jesus answered Pilate, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my, my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born. For this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. The prophet Isaiah records for us the purpose of the kingship part of the Lord's role. Um, Isaiah chapter 9, and we go, Isaiah chapter 9. And we go in at verse 6. For unto us is a child born, unto us is a son given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. Not only will Jesus be king, we will see that the kingdom will be centred around the land of Israel, which was lo the location of the throne of David. And what's more, it will be a kingdom of justice, which lasts forever. Um, one Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2 tells us, Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world be judged by you, are ye worthy to judge the smallest matters? In the scriptures, those that are faithful believers are termed saints. These are not, as in the Roman Catholic Church would have us believe, uh, miracle workers. But as it says in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 2, unto the ecclesia, of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. And uh, the, the believers in every ecclesia in the New Testament are told are named as called to be saints or the saints. If we come with me, if you would, to Revelation and chapter 7, where we where we hear a little bit more of this. Revelation chapter 7, and we'll go in at verse 9. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations, kindreds, people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palms in their hands. We again go on to verse 13. One of the elders answered and said unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes, made them white with the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God. Serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. So those who have been faithful and served God and obeyed his commands in this life will be the rulers of the kingdom to come. So what about a people? Well, all nations. Verse, uh, verse 9 of what we've just read also tells us who will be the people of this kingdom, all nations. We also saw earlier in Isaiah 2, all nations shall flow unto them. Um, Hebrews and chapter 8, if we go back a few pages, Hebrews and chapter 8 and verse 10 reads, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. It's hard to believe in the evil of today's world that all nations will worship the true God of Israel and obey his laws. So it's the kingdom 
the people of his kingdom are all nations. Where will, will be the land? Um, a very well-known quote, uh, Numbers 14 and verse 21 tells us, but as truly as I live, says God, all the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. And uh, Genesis, which we've also got up on the screen, Genesis chapter 15 and verse 18. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, to the river Euphrates. If we look at a map, we can see where Israel is today and where the Jews will call their land in the future. It will be from the Euphrates in the north there uh, to the Nile down in the south, a substantial landmass. Today, much of this is desert, but we know from Psalm 72, that tells us, there shall be a handful or handfuls of corn in the earth upon the top of the mountains. And from Micah 4, verse 4 tells us, but they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. If the kingdom centred around the land of Israel, where do you think the capital will be? Well, if I were to ask for a quote for um, where the capital will be, I'm sure Brother Phil there and Sister Pam would be shouting, I, uh, Jeremiah chapter 3. So if we go Jeremiah chapter 3 and verses 17 and 18, we read, Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 17. At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all nations shall be gathered unto it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. Verse 18. In those days the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel. They shall come together out of the land of the north, to the land that I have given for an inheritance unto your fathers. We also have this confirmed in the quote which we read earlier in Isaiah 2. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So we would uh, now um, look for what language this kingdom will have. Um, come with me if you can find it because I can't always. I've got a marker in. Uh, Zephaniah chapter 3 if we could please. Zephaniah chapter 3, and we'll read verses 8 and 9. Towards the it's the fourth last book of the Bible, of the Old Testament. Zephaniah chapter 3. Wherefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms, to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger. For all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. For then will I turn to the people a pure language, that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one assent. So what language was the Old Testament written in? Well, it was written in Hebrew. So um, religion and laws. Turn with me back a few pages to Micah, if you would, and chapter four. Where we hear the words of Amos, of, of Isaiah, almost repeated. Isaiah, uh, Micah chapter four, we go in at verse one. But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains. It shall be exalted above the hills. People shall flow unto it. Many nations shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his ways. We will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree. 
None shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts hath spoken. So in summary, God's kingdom, the king will be Jesus Christ. The rulers will be the saints. The people will be the mortal population. The land will be the whole earth. The capital, Jerusalem. The language, Hebrew. The religion, true Christianity. And the laws will be God's laws. Let's now turn to the reading which we had to introduce uh, for an introduction as it provides us with an excellent summary of what we have learned about the kingdom of God. So Ezekiel 37 and verse 21. Say unto them, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and I will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. One king shall be king over them all, and they shall be no more two nations. Neither shall they divide, be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places, wherein they have sinned, and I will cleanse them. So shall they be my people, and I will be their God. We know the Jews are back in the land, but to say they meet all the rest of this quotation at the moment is not true. So we have a kingdom centred around Israel. Verse 24, David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they, shall, and they all shall have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgment and observe my statute to do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given to Jake and to Jacob, my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt. And they shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children forever. My servant David shall be their prince forever. David means the beloved. So we have here David's greatest son, God's beloved, as king. And the law and the precepts be, uh, of God being observed. The kingdom will last forever, and as that word means, for an age. Verse 26 goes on. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them, and I will place them and multiply them and set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My tabernacle, dwelling place, also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God, and they shall be my people, and the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sac sanctify Israel, when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. This is indeed a wonderful picture of a peaceful earth ruled in justice and integrity. But when will this kingdom be set up? Come with me, if you would, uh, quickly, please, to, if we can, to Daniel chapter 2. We see recorded a vision given to Nebuchadnezzar, the kingdom uh, of a statue of a man made of various metals, which foretold of the chronology of the kingdoms of the world. Nebuchadnezzar was told that he was the head of gold and the image had feet, part of iron and part of clay, meaning the kingdoms at that time would be fragmented without a single ruler over them. This is the time we live in today, where many nations and allegiances are split between east and west, and, and instability in this world. So if we go, to, uh, if we're in Daniel chapter 2, let's go in at verse 44, please. In these days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed. The kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Verse 45 tells us, for as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain and the interpretation thereof sure. 
the stone symbolizes the return of our Lord Jesus. Um, 2 Peter 3 and verse 10 tells us, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with great noise. The elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. And Acts 1 told us, it is not for you to know the times or the season which the Father has put in his own power. We know Christ is coming and will set up a kingdom, which I want to be a part of. And uh, do you? If uh, so, in conclusion, how do we get to this kingdom? Matthew 6 and verse 33 tells us, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things shall be added unto you. So we need to seek God's righteousness. How do we do this? Come with me to John in chapter 3, if you would, please. John chapter 3, we go in at verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles thou doest except God be with thee. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. How can a man be born of water and the spirit? Well, as I'm sure you know, this refers to baptism. That word baptism in the Greek is the word baptizer, meaning to immerse, to submerge, a full immersion in water, having given a full confession of faith. This is why it has to be an adult or somebody of a full understanding of what they're doing. So not a baby. Mark chapter 16 and verse 16 tells us. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And uh, we go on to Romans chapter 6 and verse 4. Wherefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Being part of God's kingdom is reliant on belief, baptism, living a Christ-like life. Today is our opportunity. We need to use it wisely. I'll leave you with one verse from Revelation. He which testifieth these things saith, surely I come quickly. Or well, that word could be could be better um, as, as suddenly. Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Thank you, Brother Jonathan, for those very clear um, Bible passages to show to us the verity of the kingdom age and God's plan and purpose with the earth and with man. Very clear and uh, clear structure. Well, thank you. And we offer our thanks also for your work with us this morning and for being the Lord's servant this day. So before we conclude with our hymn and prayer, we have a couple of announcements in relation to the Lie Ecclesia. It's our Bible class on Wednesday evening at 8 p.m. Our speaker is due to be Brother Roy Harrison, now from the Hales Owen meeting. His subject is on the theme of peace. And next Sunday at the same time at 6 p.m., our speaker is due to be Brother Adam Muir, also from the Forley Ecclesia, just like Brother Jonathan. His subject is, are spirit gifts available today? So we will conclude with a, a prayer after our final hymn, hymn 294. Hail to the brightness of Zion's glad morning, 
joy to the lands that in darkness have lain, hushed be the accents of sorrow and mourning. Zion in triumph begins her bright reign, in 294. And so, Lord God, our Father in heaven, we approach again for the last time as an assembly this evening to once more offer our praises and to offer our thanks indeed for our brother has revealed unto us those verses, those passages of scripture which make plain to all in this world, what the future portends. With the return of the Lord Jesus Christ as King, that those dominions of men will fall as the vision of Nebuchadnezzar so aptly revealed. They will, be, they will fall and crumble to nothing. And the only power that will rise, Lord, is thy power to rule over this earth forevermore. And Lord, we are so thankful indeed and grateful that we have been shown the way of salvation, that through belief and baptism and repentance of our sinfulness, thy grace and mercy can be extended towards us and that we may be lifted out of this mortality into the glory of immortality. And these things, Lord, are marvellous in our eyes and in our hearts and minds as we contemplate that change of nature that we may become like the Lord Jesus. And so, Lord, we pray indeed that we will lift up our heads and see our redemption draw nigh in due course. For the signs of the times abound that indicate to us the culmination of thy plan and purpose. 
that give us heart indeed to continue to abide in faith for the time that remains. And so, Lord, strengthen us in our resolve, strengthen us in our endeavours in thy name, we pray. And as now we depart one from another, be with us all, Lord, we pray. Strengthen and hearten those whose knees may be slightly weakened at this time, that through the encouragement of our fellowship, we may overcome the frailties of our own hearts and minds, that we may find that resolve to keep our minds concentrated upon the words that we have had revealed to us this day, that we may be kingdom minded every hour of the day, that we may be inspired to be a true follower of the Lord Jesus Christ in all our ways and thoughts and words. Help us, Lord, in this, we pray, and be with us until we meet again. For once more, we seek thee through the mediation of the Lord Jesus, our Saviour indeed, but soon to be our King. Amen. Thank you.